At the time, Marley Mall was hot because, like I said, I was on Columbia. You know, they had Def Jam at the time, and Marley was real hot with. Um, he had Def Jam. Def just did uh, Mama Gonna Knock. Mama said Knock You Out. So he was super popping, super popping. So they came to him about approaching doing United Snakes of America. But a funny story about that song is, is that the guy who produced United Snakes of America, which is Lauren Chaney, because we only had King and Lauren produce that whole album, regardless of what the credits say and stuff. Um, Lauren's style at the time was he stacked beats, like a lot of different drum loops playing at the same time. So King having a, a DJ's and an engineer and a producer's ear, all Marley did was mute a bunch of them. <laughs> and that was the remix. <laughs> He muted a lot of the loops that was going on, took out all the sounds, and that was that. King was pissed. King was pissed. He was like, yo, you not fooling no fucking body, yo. Be like, <laughs> you not fooling no fucking body, man. So, you know, it, it was a funny thing. It was good to have an association, but we never met the dude. They sent him the reels. I mean, you know, people be thinking like, oh, he's associated. No, you didn't, motherfucker. He, he mailed them reels. He mailed them back and put his name on it and kept it pushing. That's all he did. And all he did was mute a bunch of things. I mean, it, it was what it was, man. But that's that's how it happened. That was a label thing. It wasn't like he was the homie. Like, hey, Marley, do this for me. He, he got that check. That's why he did it. <laughs> he ain't do it out of love. He did it for the love of bread. <laughs> but like I said, all he did was mute a lot of tracks. So, I mean, that's all he did. I don't think he added shit to it. <laughs> Nitro was a man, the epitome in domestic violence, 95. Right, that was the demo that I did, man. I actually recorded a lot of that stuff with Mike and I was staying in New York. And um, those was just like joints that I was trying to do, really trying to get back on as a solo artist. That was the time right after I won the battle. And I always had a close relationship with uh, Rap Pages because my one of my brothers, who was my roommate and my personal uh, my brother in spirit, Bilal, he was a, a, a writer over there. Me and Sheena was real dope, you know, close friends. So I had a close association w w with the magazine and stuff like that. So I was always able to get plugs and stuff like that. And um, that demo, that was some hot stuff, man. It was all personal stuff, man, because I, I did um, Thought You, it was called Thought You Was My Man. And it was about, because at that time I was hustling and I went through something and the cat tried to burn me on some bread and did me dirty, real sucker ass motherfucker did me dirty and stuff, man, because a lot of my dopest stuff, man, was personal experiences, man, so I wrote about that one, man, I did uh, domestic violence, and at the time, I had a real turbulent uh, relationship with this female, and that was really the result of that, and the epitome was basically something that I really uh, just had, was on my braggadocious, like, born a law or law of Mustafa or, uh, at his greatest at that time, man, some real big ball shit, you know what I'm saying, that was produced actually by my man, I Truth in New York, it was really one year at, um, it was funny, I had just got a publishing check from the New Kids on the Block Money and I went to New York and just was hanging out and doing shows and stuff like that, man. So I did all those songs while I was out there, man. And Mike and I produced two of them. And the third one uh, was produced by my man, I Truth. Okay. Uh, speaking of Bilal, the uh, next one was in 96. Uh, it was um, Bilal, it was under Enlightened Management. Uh -huh. It was demo called Rugged Minds. Oh, Rugged Minds. That actually came off of a, a, a tape that uh, was like a small, like I guess you can call it an EP. It was four songs that I had did that was produced by my man Punish, which is a longtime childhood friend of uh, Freestyle Fellowship and stuff, grew up in the jungles, man. And we actually recorded that rock project at Fat Jack's house. You know what I'm saying? We produced a lot of the um, early Abstract Rouge stuff, man. We had just got together. It's so funny, man. We, we did that demo, man, off of, uh, I think I gave him a pound of weed to do that, four songs, man. And we took like three days to do it. It was, uh, thought you was, uh, no, what was on that joint? Uh, Rugged Mind was on there, which featured my brother, My King. Um, there was another joint on there, too, with uh, Mike and I and Who Loves You, Baby. It was just, it was called Born the Law, What's Up With Your Shit. Because everybody kept on hitting me up about my music and stuff like that. So I was like, I just came out with this four song EP called Born of All the Stuff With Your Shit. But it ran around the hood for a minute. It was popping, man. It was popping. <laughs> One night of, I can't, they probably didn't rap pages. This is Freestyle Night, a place called The Graveyard Shift in 94. Right. It's like The Licks, King T, Voodoo, Razzcast, ACU, Madcap, 783, right. Hip Hop Clan. You remember this night? Yeah, I do. Is, is, that, is that night recorded anywhere? 
No, it's I've never seen no footage, man. The garage used to go on for a while. My man Eileen used to throw that place, man. He always had the prominent acts, man, in town, especially the local talent in there, man. And dudes used to get it in, homie, in there. I mean, really get it in. Even if you had a show, it was always going to be an open mic session. Everybody's going to try to take the next cat head off. Like, it was really super show off because it wouldn't necessarily be no battles, but didn't nobody want to get outdone. So it was really like one of them things, like everybody's coming with their A game. Everybody, man. But the graveyard shift, that was classic stuff right there, man. We used to get it in. That was one of the classic uh, running uh, uh, parties out in L.A. at the time, especially uh, during the period that it came when the good life was popping, uh, Freestyle Fellowship was popping, the far side, like when all of the L.A. underground stuff started to get its little run and its little vein, man, that's when the, those shows was going on and, it was just, that was the battlefield, homie. That was really the battlefield, man, because Cats was not playing back in the days, man. Cats was saying real sassy shit out of his mouth. <laughs> when I seen that right up on that, I was like, that night sounds like, it was like incredible, a most amazing man. session. But it's so many different times because I, I remember being there on so many, because it was right off of uh, Santa Monica and, um, I forget, man, where it was at Santa Monica and... Uh, over over that way, but yeah, it was crazy though, man. Like it was so many nights, man, that that stuff used to pop off. I remember seeing old Dirty Bastard there when he first came out with his solo stuff. So it, anybody could show up in that spot, man. Cats used to get it in, you know. Raz Cat started getting his shine. I think uh, Safir been in there. I might have been at that spot maybe once or twice too, because I think that's when he came out with the Hobo Junction thing and shit, man. He, you know, that's when it really started popping, man. We started getting our shine. Actually, I got associated with Ill Boogie because Michael Myers was one of my homies and stuff like that, man. We came up with a wake-up show together, doing a wake-up show. And I've been on, I'm on all his albums, you know. So the first album that he did, The Long Time Coming, I did a joint on there called uh, Cutthroat, Me and E. Rule. So the dude at the time who, had, who owned the label had heard me. And was like, yo, I wanna, you know, I wanna fucks with you. You know what I'm saying? We never really did no long term stuff because at the time I I didn't agree with the paperwork on how it was coming and stuff like that. Cause I was supposed to do an album off of there called Lord of All Worlds. But I ended up only doing a couple of singles, like I did a couple of things. I did the uh the battle record that he did with me and um the dude Grand Agent out of Philly called Patience. And then I did the uh single off of Laden Full Part Two. I did Someone to Hate and um Laid in full, so that's how it came about. We, you know, Matt we ended up producing even stuff for me later on because Matt was a dope producer. And it's funny because all these different things man moved me to the next level. Because from messing with Mike, I started messing with the Ill Boogie. When he was trying to get my album together, he introduced me to a, uh, another group of brothers called Lifelong Entertainment, which was Ivan and James. And I ended up starting to do a lot of demo stuff with them because what the Matt thing was is like at the time. He was super backpack, and I thought I was more than doing that backpack of rap like traditional L.A. underground stuff. I wanted to do a little bit more. So, uh, lifelong entertainment, they was them type of dudes. Like, yeah, let's get it in. Let's make some songs, because that was always my thing. My song, I've been published so long, and I know what the you know the songwriting aspect of it is, and a lot of MCs don't get to grasp that the songwriting and making a song. And some people is just dope MCs and can rap. We all can rhyme. Everybody got lyrics on you. But can you do a song? And that was my main focus. And I think that was kind of like the, besides the paperwork and, the, you know, the things that we was going through at Il Boogie, I think I wanted to do something a little bit wasn't as traditional to what they was putting out. So I started messing with Lifelong Entertainment, and then I did a world of stuff, man, probably like 30 songs, and we were shopping a deal and everything. And um, just out of frustration, I just burned out for a little bit and, you know, took my time, and that's when I came back with my new stuff with the Tabernacle MCs, and I just came up with the whole concept, man. I just started putting it in perspective. I came up with the Tabernacle MCs and the Church of Hip Hop and Financial Prosperity. And the philosophy of it is, is that we teach God as the MC. Because the Bible said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, so therefore God had to be an MC. And he gave his only begotten son, and his begotten son is the B-boy. The B-boy is the one that came to us with the four miracles, which are the four elements of hip hop graffiti, break dancing, DJ, and an MC. But the B-Boy's been crucified. The B-Boy's been crucified by the industry, whack rappers that don't know their history or know anything about the art form. So the Church of Hip Hop is about resurrecting the B-Boy, which is basically resurrecting my era of hip hop back. So, 
And when I came up with that philosophy, that's what we do, man. You know what I'm saying? We have a whole philosophy about it. Like I said, I told you about how God is the MC. God's first graffiti was the stars, the hieroglyphics, when you see the different astrologies. That's God's first, that's God's first canvas. That's the first place he hit up at. God's first turntable was the solar system, the way the planets revolve around the sun. That's why the early, you hear the early prophecy of the planet rock, because that was God's first turntable. You see what I'm saying? And God, and break dancing and pop locking is really when God created man and your heart pops and your organs backspin and do all that. That's the first break dance. So basically what I did was is I gave interpretation, a hip hop inter interpretation to these teachings that we hear every day. Who, so who, who all is involved in Tabernacle MCs? Well, Tabernacle MCs is me, and I'm, you know, I go by, and everybody, when you come into the church, you're born again, and you have your church name, so I'm born a law, but I'm also known as the Apostle Sweet Daddy Grace. My partner is Panama Red, a.k.a. Deacon Wendell Duckets. And then you have other members of it, you know, my brother Akim, that's Pastor Pastor Offerings, my man Soul King, that's Bishop T.D. Cakes, the T.D. stands for Touch the Cakes, you know, my man Big Arch, that's Reverend Checkmo Dollars. My man Zach Blue Brown from Global Flotations, that's Reverend, that's Reverend Revenue. You know, even Medusa's involved. We got some songs with Medusa. That's Sister Hit Him with the Good Book. You know what I'm saying? So when you come in, we got my man uh, Shody Rock, that's uh, Big Face Bill Bardicus. <laughs> Everybody comes in and it's just having fun and like I said, really resurrecting the music and it's the Church of Hip Hop and Financial Prosperity because we're about getting our money without selling out the music. Thank you.